Each kidney is supplied with blood by a single renal artery that arises on its respective side of the aorta before dividing into five segmental arteries that enter the hilus. Within the kidney, each segmental artery branches into several lobular arteries. The lobular arteries further subdivide to form interlobular arteries, which branch off into afferent arterioles. Blood flows into the glomeruli through the afferent arterioles. Blood flows out of the glomerulus through the efferent arteriole. The afferent and efferent arterioles regulate glomerular capillary pressure by selectively dilating or constricting. The kidney's venous blood, now filtered, flows from the glomerulus via the efferent arterioles into the peritubular capillary network, a low-pressure, reabsorptive system surrounding all portions of the tubules. This arrangement permits rapid movement of solutes and water between the fluid in the tubular lumen and the blood in the capillaries. The peritubular capillaries rejoin to form the venous channels by which blood leaves the kidneys and empties into the inferior vena cava. Urine formation involves the filtration of the blood by the glomerulus to form an ultrafiltrate of urine, the tubular reabsorption of electrolytes and nutrients needed to maintain the constancy of the internal environment, and the secretion of waste materials. Filtration occurs as blood flows into the glomerulus from its afferent arteriole, and plasma moves through the glomerular capillaries into Bowman space. From Bowman space, the glomerular filtrate moves into the tubular segments of the nephron. Here, through tubular reabsorption, electrolytes and nutrients move from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. Here also, through tubular secretion, substances move from the paratubular capillaries into the urine filtrate. The filtrate concentrates in the collecting tubules, then finds its way to the renal pelvis, where it is directed to the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra for elimination. The kidneys perform an excretory function by filtering the blood and then selectively reabsorbing those materials that are needed to maintain a stable internal environment. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney and is composed of a glomerulus, which filters the blood, and a tubular component, where necessary substances are reabsorbed into the bloodstream and unneeded materials are secreted into the tubular filtrate for elimination in urine. All right. Here we go with the urinary system. Now, with our urinary system, most people think of urine. And you can't think of urine without thinking of your kidneys. But where does urine come from? Ultimately, it's nitrogenous waste. It's concentrated urea. And where does urea come from? Again, you can see the nitrogen in urea. Urea comes from ammonia, and ammonia comes from the amino group of chopped up amino acids and these amino acids get chopped up in your liver so we go from amino acids to urea in your liver and then the urea goes through your cardiovascular system to your kidney so again as you eat food um, we have to digest and chemically break down that food. So it's, if you eat a drumstick of chicken, it's not like the chicken muscle becomes your muscle. We break the chicken muscle, the protein filaments within the chicken muscle, down into those individual amino acids through pepsin and trypsin and peptidases within our digestive system. And then... It gets small enough to get into our circulatory system, and we don't chop up all of the amino acids in our liver, right? Because we need these amino acids to do protein synthesis and translation within every single one of our cells. So this is the raw material for everything else, but some of the amino acids do get chopped up in our liver and by the hepatocytes, and that gives us urea. This urea is going to flow up to your heart from your liver. Once it's in your heart, it's going to get pumped out to your lungs, pick up some oxygen, drop off some carbon dioxide. It's going to come back to your heart and get pumped back out and head down to your kidneys where that urea can be removed. So when we look at our kidney, first off, 
we have the medulla and the cortex. The medulla are these parts here. And the cortex is this outer ring. Now we have nephrons, which is the functional unit that we're really going to focus on in this video. So the nephrons are made up of a renal corpuscle, which is this, which is the glomerulus, which is this little um, band of capillaries. You have the Bowman's capsule, which is the beginning of the renal tubule. And the renal tubule contains the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending and ascending loops of Henle, the collecting duct, and the distal convoluted tubule before you get to the collecting duct. Now, this doesn't look at, make it look very convoluted, which we'll look at some other things. But the amazing part here, all of these collecting ducts dump into this renal pelvis, and that ultimately heads to your bladder. Now, these nephrons, it just looks pretty simple. And we look at, we simplify this a lot to make it easier to understand. But we have 1.25 million nephrons per kidney. So if you stretched out all the nephrons, they'd be 85 miles in length. That's incredible. Now, one other thing to point out, which we'll see again later, is that, again, we have the cortex on the outside, and this medulla is kind of on the inside. And it's these loops of Henle that dip down into the medulla and the collecting ducts run through the medulla. But all of the rest of this stuff, the glomerulus and the proximal and distal convoluted tubules are all up in the cortex here. So just to break this down, okay? So urine production, to produce urine, which is concentrated urea, right? We have to have filtration, reabsorption, and then secretion. So urine is basically concentrated urea, which is nitrogenous waste, which is the chopped up bits from our, our amino acids, our proteins. And it also includes some excess hydrogen ions, which um, hydrogen ions are associated with acids, right? So blood is initially filtered. And when we have this mechanical filtration, the blood is going to keep some water, obviously, because it has to keep on flowing. And it's going to keep all the blood cells, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and those proteins, all the, the big, um, or the, the globulins and the albumins and the fibrinogens, all that stuff is going to stay in the blood and not go into the tubule. Everything smaller than that gets filtered out into the tube that leads to your bladder. But along that length of tube, there are some small things that we want back. And um, everything beneficial ends up getting reabsorbed. But again, we can secrete hydrogen ions into the tubule. And a lot of what the amount of what gets secreted and the amount of what gets reabsorbed a lot of times ties back into our controlling our blood pressure. So again, um, as we have the renal tubule, and this one looks a little bit more convoluted here. Our corpuscle is the glomerulus, surrounded by the Bowman's capsule. Um, and then we have the tubule, which is the proximal convoluted tubule, the ascending and descending, descending and ascending loops of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. So from the collecting ducts, it heads to the renal pelvis. From the renal pelvis, it heads to the ureter, down to the urinary bladder, and then out your body through the urethra. So I'm going to break down this complicated um, model of a nephron. And again, this is pretty simplified, but um, I'm going to try and take it step by step to help you guys understand how nephrons actually work, because these are the functional units of your kidney. So where are we? Again, we have the cortex and the medulla. So that's the first thing I'm splitting apart here. Now, we're going to have blood vessels. 
blood's going to come in and it's going to head back out. We are going to have the tubule, which begins with the Bowman's capsule. And then we're going to have the proximal convoluted tubule. We are going to have the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. So those are all the an anatomical things within a um, within a nephron. Now, as I said before, within your blood, the large proteins that were made by your liver and the blood cells are not going to get filtered out. They are just going to stay flowing in the blood and stay remain in circulation if everything's working properly, right? Now, in the Bowman's capsule, we have filtration. And in some of those other slides, they've been talk it's been talking about these podocytes, which are like feet cells. Now, when we talk about transporting across membranes, a lot of times we talk about the channels or the pumps and everything that lets things through. Now, this is more mechanical filtration. So anything smaller than these gaps is going to fit through and um, is going to enter into the tubule. So first thing we're going to talk about, and whenever you see these little blue dots, that's going to be water. Water will get shot into the Bowman's capsule. Urea, the yellow dots are going to represent the nitrogenous waste urea. This is meant to represent nutrients such as glucose. Okay, so it's small. A monosaccharide is small and will go into the tubule. We're also going to have a variety of ions such as calcium ions. And we've talked about calcium ions before, the role they play. They play an important role in muscle contraction, but also with neurotransmitter release and also the secreting of certain hormones. So we've got our calcium ions. In addition, we have sodium ions. Now we've talked about sodium ions with nervous system communication. We also have um, bicarbonate ions. Now bicarbonate ions are really important for buffering your blood and keeping the pH at the appropriate level. We are also going to have chloride ions. So sodium and chloride together make salt, but um, within your body they don't really exist as salt. Um, they're going to exist as ions. Now as we progress further, Again, those are the guys that we're talking about that are small and getting filtered that are, have been pushed into the tubule. So from here, we are going into the proximal convoluted tubule. The water will go on. The water, again, a tremendous amount of the water, initially 60 to 70 percent of the water is going to dissolve back into the blood right away. We are also going to have our nutrients like glucose and almost all those nutrients in the very beginning are going to go back into the blood. The same thing with the bicarbonate. Very important ion. We need that in our blood. The calcium as well. Um, now calcium reabsorption is um, also controlled through your parathyroid hormone released from your parathyroid glands up by your um, like the little bow tie uh, gland on your neck your thyroid gland right around your trachea so you that is those are really important when it comes to regulating the calcium in your blood and monitoring that to keep it at homeostasis so if parathyroid hormone is present in the blood, it will allow the reabsorption of calcium back into the blood. We also have chloride ions, and those are going to stay. We also have the urea. That's going to stay. 
And now in the area of our kidney, around this area, there are also hydrogen ions, and that's what these black positives are representing. So these hydrogen ions are going to get secreted into the proximal convoluted tubule. So moving on, we've talked about everybody who got sent back to the blood, who's staying in, and we've got hydrogen ions being secreted into the tubule. In the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the water is going to continue on. A lot of more water will also be reabsorbed back into the blood. The sodium ions are going to continue on. The chloride ions are going to continue on. The hydrogen ions are going to continue on. And the urea is going to continue on. So the only thing that we are losing in the descending limb, or that's being reabsorbed into the blood, is some more water. As we head back up towards the cortex of the kidney, we are heading into the ascending limb. The water is going to continue on. The sodium ions are going to a lot of those will be um, reabsorbed into the blood at this point. The chloride ions also will be reabsorbed at this point. The hydrogen ions stay in and the urea stays in. As we head to the cortex, we'll get into the proximal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. In this area, we have more things controlled through hormones. So the water is continuing on. Again, based a lot about, based on our blood pressure, um, the amount of water that gets peed out, the amount of water that gets brought in, back into our blood is going to be hormone driven. And that's gonna be from antidiuretic hormone, which is released from our pituitary gland. So if antidiuretic hormone is present in the blood, water will be reabsorbed, more water will be reabsorbed into the blood. The rest of the water will continue towards your um, renal pelvis and ultimately down your ureter to your bladder. The sodium ions can move again back out to the blood if aldosterone is present. And aldosterone is another hormone released from um, your adrenal gland that's going to control sodium reabsorption and also um, potassium secretion. So again, if aldosterone is present in the blood, and again, these this reabsorption and secretion is important to control blood pressure as well. So, and we want the blood pressure to increase if um, we are in a fight or flight um, experience, um, and that's gonna be controlled by our adrenal gland, right? So again, if we get the sodium and the chlorides back into our blood, we're going to increase water reabsorption and also ultimately increase our blood pressure. Now, we can get rid of some potassium if that aldosterone is present as well. The hydrogen ions are gonna continue on and the urea is going to continue on. Ultimately, now we've got, we're towards our point of having urine. So all the important things that we need to keep, whether it's nutrients or water or bicarbonate, um, um, a lot of those things are being kept and depending on our blood pressure, will determine how much water or sodium or chloride we also keep. But what we're peeing out here is basically all of this nitrogenous waste. Notice none of the hydrogen ions got reabsorbed. They were secreted in. And all this nitrogenous waste, all this urea, none of that got reabsorbed into our blood. So it's kind of a crazy long process to get rid of the urea because we've got to we've got to filter out a lot of things that we want back. Um, 
but it's again one of those things not just getting rid of nitrogenous waste but also another um, way to maintain our blood pressure so at the glomerulus filtration produces a filtrate blood pressure pushes everything but the blood cells and the largest proteins through the slits and the podocytes into the bowman's capsule and into the pct the proximal convoluted tubule at the PCT, water and almost all of the dissolved nutrients get reabsorbed. Bicarbonate is reabsorbed. Calcium ions will be reabsorbed if parathyroid hormone is present. We can also get some hydrogen ions secreted into the tubular fluid. More reabsorption. So in the loop of Henle, water is going to be reabsorbed. We are also going to pump out sodium and chloride ions as we go through the ascending limb we are going to at the end the distal convoluted tubule the dct and the collecting ducts depending on the hormones present we may um, re um, reabsorb uh, sodium or we may push out potassium into the tubule in addition, if antidiuretic hormone, ADH, is present, we will get rid of more water. Ultimately, what remains in the tubular fluid and the collecting ducts is concentrated urea and other wastes like hydrogen ions, and those are ultimately excreted from the body. Holy smokes. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, if we roll through this really quick, I mean, there's a lot of different things and a lot of different parts. But again, all this kind of stuff comes back to just taking it one little bit at a time to try and understand all of that stuff that's going on. So, quick look at some of the hormones again. Antidiuretic hormone is going to cause water to be reabsorbed from the tubular fluid back into the blood. Aldosterone. If you see this going in, it must be a lipid-based hormone, right? Because it's going in and it's ultimately affecting the DNA, turning on genes. And the genes that are going to be turned on are for protein channels and pumps. So if we get more channels and more pumps, we are going to then have the ability to secrete potassium into the tube and reabsorb sodium back into the tube which then can be pumped back into the blood and potassium can be pumped in so again we usually think of a sodium potassium pump in our nervous system in our neurons however they also exist the sodium potassium pumps within the walls of our kidney tubules so this huge thing is the amazing complexity of how blood pressure is maintained because again a function of the kidney is to get rid of nitrogenous waste but we also are going to play a major role in monitoring and affecting your blood pressure so if there is a decrease in the renal perfusion so if the blood is getting pushed out of the glomerulus less strongly so there's a decrease in how hard the water is getting pushed out the kidney is going to release a hormone and this is why the kidney kind of also fits into your um, endocrine system because the kidney is going to release renin renin would interact with angiotensinogen which is a hormone released from your liver so the liver is also an endocrine organ and it's releasing angiotensinogen. An ogen is an active, it's a zymogen, it's an inactive form. The renin will convert the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. This hormone precursor will go up to the lungs where there is an enzyme present. That enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin II is another active hormone that will increase sympathetic activity. It will increase the sodium and chloride reabsorption and potassium excretion. 
um, because it will also tell your adrenal gland to release aldosterone, which is going to um, affect this process of sodium reabsorption and calcium or chloride re reabsorption and potassium um, excretion into the tubule. Angiotensin II is also going to affect vasoconstriction, which is going to increase blood pressure. And angiotensin II is also going to go up and talk to your, anterior, your pituitary gland, the posterior lobe, which will then secrete antidiuretic hormone, which will go down and have your body reabsorb more water, which will ultimately raise your blood pressure. So a lot of your blood pressure is monitored by your kidney, which is then through this complex series of hormones can increase your blood pressure. Now, we talked a little bit about cholesterol and hypertension in when we were talking about the liver and um, that stuff, but the number one prescribed drugs in the United States are blood pressure medications. A lot of cholesterol medications are out there too, but blood pressure medications. So most blood pressure medications, all of these things are increasing blood pressure, right? So most blood pressure medications work inhibitor as an inhibitor to some one of these things. You can take ACE inhibitors. You can um, take uh, water pills so you pee more. So most of these things, um, most drugs that are related to hypertension or high blood pressure focus on this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So in addition, your analysis, again, we talked, it's mostly urea, concentrated urea, water, a couple other ways, but we can also use your analysis based off of what you're peeing out to figure out if there are other things that you have issues with um, in addition to um, whether your kidneys are working, um, but other endocrine um, hormones, and you can also monitor um, for drugs because the metabolites, the breakdowns of, of drugs will come out in your urine as well. So um, kidneys are amazing. Uh, there's a lot going on with your um, with that whole renal tubule and the secretion and the reabsorption, the filtration, but hopefully this gets you on your way to understanding some of that. So that is the end. The two kidneys are bean-shaped organs which are located close to the back. Each kidney receives the blood flow from the renal artery which branches off the abdominal aorta, the main artery which runs down the center of the body. Blood passes from the kidney into the vena cava via the renal vein. The ureter allows the flow of urine from the kidney to the bladder. The functional mass of the kidney is divided in the cortex and medulla, which are made up of intertwined tubules called nephrons and collecting ducts, and also blood vessels. Here we pass through the cortex. There are approximately 1 million nephrons in each kidney. Here we focus on one showing the renal corpuscle and the extending tubule. The Bowman's capsule is a cup-like structure which surrounds a glomerulus, a network of blood vessels. The blood vessels act like a sieve, filtering the blood that passes into the kidney. The filtered blood, which we call filtrate, passes into the tubule, is then processed by the nephron and will ultimately become urine. Each tubule divides into the proximal tubule, the descended limb of Henley's loop, the ascending limb of Henley's loop, the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. We will now look at the transport of sodium and water in each region by traveling through the nephron. The proximal tubule initiates at the Bowman's capsule. 65% of filtrate moves from the proximal tubule back into the blood. This process is called reabsorption. The movement of water occurs secondary to that of sodium and other osmolites. The movement of sodium from the tubular fluid into the cell is mediated by a battery of sodium coupled exchanges, which move sodium and hydrogen in opposite directions across the cell wall. 
Consequently, the reabsorption of sodium largely occurs in exchange for the secretion of hydrogen into the filtrate. Water reabsorption occurs through the water channels aquaporin 1 and 7. As the nephron leaves the cortex and descends into the renal medulla, the reabsorption of water and sodium are separated. This happens because the ascending and descending limbs of Henle have different permeabilities for water and sodium. The descending limb of the loop of Henle has a relatively low permeability to sodium but a high permeability to water due to the presence of aquaporin 1 channels. In the ascending limb, sodium, potassium and chloride are transported from the luminal fluid into the cell via the co-transporter in a ratio of 1 to 1 to 2. 5 to 10% of sodium reabsorption occurs in the distal connecting tubule through the sodium channels ENAC and NCC. This region does not have aquaporin water channels and therefore its permeability to water is low. Here, sodium leaves the filtrate but water does not. The collecting duct is responsible for the fine tuning of sodium reabsorption. The movement of water and sodium from the lumen to the blood are under the regulation of vasopressin and aldosterone which are released depending on whether the body needs to conserve water and sodium.